Let's see if this is how you're feeling right now. Watch this. That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello? There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, with some Please do something. Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's not enough left to do, is it? person beside you. Just do a temperature taking here. Anything about your ministry with youth at your church that feels stuck? And if you can, what's keeping you on the escalator? Go. Take one more minute. you back together again. I was at a conference of young pastors, obviously I was an observer, um, about a year ago. And in a breakout session, they, what they did was they divided everybody into groups of about 12. These were young pastors under 35. And in a breakout session, one woman asked her colleagues, would you go to the church you serve if you weren't being paid? You want to know how many people said yes? Two. And the issue wasn't about leadership or about um, even the age of the congregation or about conflict. The issue was inevitably a disconnect between the young pastor's understanding of what the church was supposed to be and the rest of the congregation. The statistics are challenging. We talked about those this morning. Um, congregations, you know, tend to take on the characteristics of the most visible pastor, the most visible leader, which is why over time, your congregation winds up being about 10 years younger to 10 years older than the most visible pastor. You got a 10-year range there. So we get this constant refrain that we talked about this morning. We need, you know, how do we get more people? How do we get more young people? How do we get more clergy? How do we get more diverse clergy? And if we get more young people, we'll solve for the other ones. This morning we talked about a couple of things that we don't want to do, a couple of myths that we don't want to buy into. 
Uh, this afternoon, I'm just going to suggest one thing that we can do to kind of lay some foundations um, for being a younger church, and we're going to move to the practical essentials of this tomorrow morning. Tomorrow will be the really practical part. Um, and with this, I'm going to dazzle you with my originality, okay? So the one thing that we can do to become a younger and more hopeful church, more hopeful denomination, is simply this, be the church. Now, obviously, right? We've got that. Or do we? Moralistic therapeutic deism is our culture's version of domesticated Christianity. You know this picture from Dogma, the movie, right? A domesticated Christianity is simply when we try to make Jesus more like us instead of us becoming more like him. And this, is, this sin, let's call it what it is, has been around since Babel. So it's not a new issue. The book that I wrote about it, there have been a million others, um, is called Almost Christian. It's a title of a John Wesley sermon. You know, you may recognize that. It was George Whitfield had a title, a sermon with the same title based on the same passage, and both of them were aimed at the indifferent spirituality of the realm. So the question is, how do we keep letting these mutant strains of Christianity infiltrate the real gospel? And we do this generation after generation after generation. Every culture has a different reason for this. But here's what I think our culture's reason is, and I believe young people are calling us out on it. In the U.S., the church seems to have lost track of what I call our missional imagination. And what that means is we've lost track of what the church actually is. By a missional imagination, I mean something really simple. It's simply the ability of the church being able to imagine ourselves as existing for somebody other than ourselves. Okay, so the one thing that we can just sort of take home from this is mission is not a trip, okay? Now, I've been on a million of them. There are good things and there are bad things, and, but mission is not this. Mission is the very identity of the church. You don't form a church and then have a church committee sit around and decide, now, what's our mission going to be? Because if we don't have a mission, we don't have a church, right? Mission is not a church activity, it's not a youth trip, it's not a model of ministry, and it's not optional. Mission is the business we are in. So that includes young people. There's a reason we send youth on mission trips on our behalf. They'll go, okay? <laughs> they will be the church. They haven't learned 50 ways to fortify themselves against it yet. They haven't learned how to make the gospel what they want it to be yet. They have yet to learn that from us. So when they hear Jesus say, feed my sheep, they don't think about spiritualizing it. They don't think about voting for somebody who will help the school lunch program. What they think is food. We should get some and give it to people. <laughs> Somehow, young people are better than we are at recognizing when we adults are kidding ourselves. Are we the church? Do we act like people who have been sent out into the world to be the body, the fingers and toes and heart and mind of Christ? If you want to know the truth, ask a teenager. Because unless the church enacts a missional imagination and invites young people to enact it alongside of us, all we can be about is training fleas. So, this is a very different approach to mission than most of us have gotten used to. So here, uh, I'll try my little object lesson here, see if this will illustrate the point. Okay. This is the world. This is God's grace, and this is us. Now, we ought to be in the bowl here, but so that you can see it, I'm going to lift it up. All right. Here's what we think mission is. We've gotten used to thinking of mission this way. All right, we go find ourselves a place a church, a community somewhere where we can get some of God's grace. And then we look around and we look and see, okay, now who can we dump Jesus on? 
Okay. Now I'm empty again. I guess I got to go back to church and get me some more Jesus and let Jesus fill me up a little bit more. Now look around. Okay, who else needs some of Jesus? Let me go dump him on somebody. Well, now I'm empty again. So I guess I'll go back to church and I'll get me a little bit more Jesus, go dump Jesus on somebody else. Okay, there's a million things wrong with this. Not the least of which is it's exhausting. We're empty all the time, right? It's also treating Jesus as though Jesus were some family heirloom who was ours to hand on, as though Jesus hasn't gotten there before we were on the scene to begin with, right? Now, I wonder whether a more helpful way of thinking about mission might look something like this. This is still the world. This is still us. This is still God's grace, although we're Methodist, right? So we don't start on empty. Okay. <laughs> it's good that you got that. <laughs> I hang out with Presbyterians way too much to be healthy. <laughs> anyway, all right, so I think maybe mission looks something like this. Yes, we do find a place, a community, a source, the scripture somewhere where we receive God's grace, where God fills us, Jesus fills us. But the thing is, God doesn't know when to stop. Jesus just keeps filling us. God keeps pouring God's grace upon grace upon us until we can't hold it all. And grace starts to splash off of us, the church, into the world around us. And the trick is, the only way this is going to work is if we stay close enough to the source of God's grace and close enough in the world to the people who need to get wet. That's how mission works.